Chapter 11 A Change of Realms From Flesh to Spirit Thus far we have considered six scriptural representations of regeneration, each of which has given us further insight into the nature of this great miracle. What is regeneration? It is a new creation, a new man, a new heart, a new birth, a new nature. It is a crucifixion of our old self and resurrection of our new self. But regeneration is more. It is an exchange of realms. Flesh versus Spirit For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the Spirit is life and peace. Because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so, and those who are in the flesh cannot please God. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. Romans chapter 8, verses 5 through 9. It is clear from these verses that regeneration involves a change of realms. Unregenerate men are spoken of as those who are in the flesh. Regenerate men are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. It is tragic that the NIV replaces the words in the flesh in verse 8 and 9 with the words controlled by the sinful nature. Here, biblical translation has given way to theological fancy. Christians are those who are no longer in the flesh. They now reside permanently in the realm of the spirit. Sometimes Christians will say when they have acted impulsively or perhaps lost their temper, I got in the flesh. In reality, however, the Christian can no more temporarily get in the flesh than can temporarily become unregenerate. What does Paul mean when he says that the unregenerate man is in the flesh and the Christian is no longer in the flesh but in the spirit? The answer could be stated like this. The natural, unregenerate man resides in the realm or sphere of the fleshly. The flesh is the source and context of his whole life. He knows nothing of life in the Holy Spirit. He lives entirely on the fleshly plane. He inhabits the realm of glands and physical appetites, of cars and computers, of sports and entertainment, of cosmetics and appearance. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging in the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and whereby nature, children of wrath, even as the rest. Whose end is destruction? Whose God is is their appetite, and whose glory is their shame? Who set their minds on earthly things? The unregenerate man may have religion, but it too is fleshly. Paul tells us of a time when he knew Christ according to the flesh. This is the Christ of popular religious imagination, ever-changing with the times. In our day, he is often a pale, insipid religious figure who lived long ago and went around carrying lambs. Paul no longer knows Christ in this way, however. In fact, he no longer knows any man according to the flesh. Why not? The answer is given in the very next verse. 
Paul has passed into a different realm. Therefore, from now on we recognize no man according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. Therefore, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things passed away. Behold, new things have come. This contrast between the two realms of flesh and spirit underlies our Lord's words to the Samaritan woman in John 4. Woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem shall you worship the Father. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. Usually we take these words to mean that people can worship God anywhere, either in this mountain or in Jerusalem. This is certainly true, but Jesus does not say either or. He says neither nor. In other words, God cannot be worshipped in this realm at all. He is accessible only in the Spirit. God is Spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in Spirit and truth. We are the true circumcision who worship in the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. For through Him, Christ, we both have our access in one Spirit to the Father. Christians are in the Spirit. They are able to see Him who is invisible and to look at the things which are not seen. Only two realms. The first lesson that we should learn from Romans 8, 5 through 9 is that Paul thinks in terms of only two realms. A man is either in the flesh or in the spirit. He is either unregenerate or regenerate. There is no half and half, third realm. A man is either fleshly, a non-Christian, or he is spiritual, alive in the realm of the Holy Spirit, a Christian. This same dichotomy is seen in 1 Corinthians 2, 14-16. But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. But he who is spiritual, appraises all things, yet he himself is appraised by no man. We have the mind of Christ. Here again, there are only two types of men, the natural man, unregenerate, and the spiritual man, regenerate. This fact takes us a long way toward a proper understanding of what Paul says in the next four verses. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual men, but as to men of flesh, as to babes in Christ. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, for you were not yet able to receive it. Indeed, even now you are not yet able, for you are still fleshly. For since there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not fleshly, and are you not walking like mere men? For when one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not mere men? The NIV wrongly translates the term fleshly in these verses as worldly. What is Paul saying here? He is saying that the Corinthian believers are, in some ways, acting like lost men. 
I could not speak to you like Christians. I had to speak to you like men of flesh. You are acting like mere men. You need to have your minds renewed to realize who you really are. It is possible for a Christian to act at times like a lost man, especially when he is still a babe in Christ. But this is a far cry from saying that a true Christian can live his entire life like a lost man. Contrary to much popular teaching, Paul is not setting forth here some permanent third category of men, the so-called carnal Christian, a sort of heavenly devil, who lives his life with Christ in the heart and self on the throne. A Christian can at times act like a lost man, but when he does, he is acting out of character with who he really is, and he cannot maintain the facade for long. Each realm has its own mind. The second lesson that we should learn from Romans 8, 5 through 9 is that each of the two realms is characterized by a certain type of mind. For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. Notice that Paul is not making an exhortation here. He is not saying what ought to be. He is simply stating a fact. Those who are according to the flesh mind the things of the flesh. Those who are according to the Spirit mind the things of the Spirit. This is just the reality of the situation. This means that if anyone claims to be a Christian but does not mind the things of the Spirit, He is deceived. The Christian is alive in a new realm. He is in the Spirit. His source and sphere of life is the Holy Spirit. And he is just naturally inclined toward the things of the Spirit. When he gets out of bed in the morning, when he is given a few minutes to relax at work, when he has some leisure time, His mind gravitates toward the things of God. Each mind has its own outcome. The third lesson that we should learn from Romans 8, 5 through 9, is that each type of mind leads to its own outcome, either death or life. The mind set on the flesh, mind of the flesh, is death. Death is its ultimate characteristic and end, regardless of how pleasant things may appear at its beginning. Think of it. Everything in the fleshly realm, even the best things, will eventually leave us with nothing but emptiness, decay, and corruption. Death. Why? Because God is the source of true life. And He is left out of the picture. Not only is God left out of the picture, but the mind of the flesh is actually hostile towards God. For it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. There is a deep-seated hatred for God and His law in the heart of every lost man. It is for this reason that those who are in the flesh cannot please God. In the religious lost man, this enmity is often well hidden, but under the right circumstances, it will lash out viciously. Here, we need only to think of the reaction of the scribes and Pharisees when they encountered goodness incarnate. Crucify him! We will not have this man to reign over us. Perhaps many even of these religious leaders were shocked by their own actions 
and the vehement hatred that they found welling up in their hearts toward the Son of God. The mind of the flesh is death, but, by contrast, the mind of the Spirit is life and peace. What a blessed thing this is! All things that are good, all things that are lovely, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, belong to and flow from the realm of the Spirit. Walking in the New Realm But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passion and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5 verses 16 through 25 In these verses from Galatians 5, the two realms of flesh and spirit are sharply contrasted. Paul makes it clear that those who practice the deeds of the flesh shall not inherit the kingdom of God. On the other hand, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. They have made a definite break with the old realm and life of sin through repentance and faith in Christ. The Christian is now promised victory over the flesh as he walks in the Spirit. Walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. Of special significance for our present study, however, is verse 25. If we live by, or in, the Spirit, let us also walk by, or in, the Spirit. Notice again that we have already seen in Romans 8, the Christian is one who is in the Spirit. He lives in the realm of the Spirit, and his source of life is the Spirit. Now, says Paul, realize where you are and walk there. Live it out in practice. If you live in the Spirit, then walk in the Spirit. There are two and only two realms, and as Christians, we are alive in the realm of the Spirit. Because we are now alive in this new realm, we are, for the first time, able to walk by the power of the Spirit, available to us in the place where we now are. This walk in the Spirit involves obeying the Spirit's promptings when we sense in our hearts that He is grieved by something we are about to do. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. When the Spirit is grieved, we must stop immediately. On the other hand, to walk in the Spirit also involves obeying the Spirit's promptings when He urges us to do something positive, to speak up for God, or witness, or pray. Do not quench the Spirit. It is as we walk in the Spirit that we experience the good and lovely fruit of the Spirit, discussed above. 
the two realms in Romans 7 and 8. The concept of regeneration as a change of realms between the flesh and the spirit is of great significance for our understanding of many other scriptures. In particular, it is foundational to a proper understanding of Romans 7. Notice that Paul introduces his whole discussion in Romans 7, 7 through 25, by referring to the two realms in verses 5 and 6. For while we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in the members of our body to bear fruit for death. But now we have been released from the law, having died to that by which we were bound, so that we serve in newness of the Spirit and not in oldness of the letter. Here again, Paul thinks in terms of two and only two groups. Those who are in the flesh, unregenerate, are characterized by sinful passions at work in the members of their bodies to bear fruit for death. These sinful passions are aroused by the law. Christians, on the other hand, are characterized by release from bondage to the law and by service in newness of the Spirit and not in oldness of the letter. It is not difficult to discover which of these two groups the man of Romans 7 belongs to. He is of flesh, sold into bondage to sin. The law is arousing all sorts of sinful passions in him. He is a prisoner to the law of sin, which is in his members. He is a wretched man, seeking someone to set him free from the body of his death. Furthermore, he never makes mention of the Holy Spirit even once in the entire passage. Clearly, this man is not in the Spirit, but in the flesh. For a Christian, to turn to Romans 7 for comfort when he is defeated is therefore inexcusable, even though at times he may feel as if he belongs there. It is very significant that as soon as Paul has concluded his consideration of law, sin, and flesh in Romans 7, 7 through 25, he immediately summarizes everything once more in terms of the two realms. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did, sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and as an offering for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh in order that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Again, these verses are simply an expanded restatement of Paul's earlier introduction to this section in Romans 7, 5-6. Notice that in verse 4, Christians are described as those who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. As we saw earlier in connection with verse 5, this is not an exhortation, but a statement of fact. It is not a description of certain advanced Christians, but of the general walk of all Christians. The verses that follow this summary 8, 5 through 14, continue Paul's discussion of flesh and spirit and have already been considered above.